Ahoy there, scruffy artisan. I'm Guybrush Threepwood, mighty pirate. Ahoy yourself. I be Gaffer Crimp Digit, pirate glassblower. What's this alphabet sale all about? Well, it's the latest thing. I make unbreakable tubes in the shapes of letters, which can be used to create festive, illuminated business signs, novelty mementos, or lamps. Kitchy. Aye, very can't. Consonants cost 48 pieces of eight. But today I'm giving away one free vowel per customer. Would you like a vowel? Well, I think I'd like one of those free vowel tubes. You'd like to buy a vowel, eh? Here you go. A U? What about A, E, I, O? Or even Y? All sold out. All we got is U tubes these days. Monkey Island was initially released on Windows and Wii in July 2009. In 2010, it was ported to PlayStation, and in 2012, I decided to buy all five episodes without any context of the other games in the franchise. Telltale Games developed and published the game after licensing the property from LucasArts, and if taken in context of the entire franchise, it is the fifth game. But for me, it was the first Monkey Island game I played. Guybrush Threepwood, Mighty Pirate. I don't know the full Guybrush Threepwood lore, and many of the jokes and characters were lost on me, particularly in the first episode. However, when Telltale releases itself from the original franchise, this is a studio that is capable of telling tremendous stories. Today, most people know Telltale Games through its award-winning Walking Dead series, as well as its adventure games for Borderlands and Game of Thrones. When Tales of Monkey Island came out, Telltale was still a very small studio with only a few games under its belt. I would like to argue that this game put them on the map, but generally speaking, every Telltale game is better than the last. And while Tales of Monkey Island sold better than any of their other titles, its sales were eventually beaten by Back to the Future the Game. Game Taffy of the Month is a new podcast based on community voted games on the Game Taffy Plays Facebook group. In the future, I will be joined by members of the community to analyze each month's game and try to find what impact that title has on the world of gaming, on the art of gaming. For this inaugural episode, I am alone, trying to set a tone for future episodes. You are welcome to join the conversation by joining the Facebook group, commenting on this video or podcast, and connecting with me on most social platforms. For now, it's time to tell a story. Each of the five chapters begins with a prologue, either recapping the events of the previous episode or setting up the story for this episode. Launch of the Screaming Narwhal begins with Guybrush Threepwood chasing his mortal enemy, LeChuck, and attempting to rescue his wife, Elaine. All right, LeChuck, put down the monkey and back away from my wife. Star Threepwood, you led me a merry chase. But soon the dread mysteries of these ancient simians will be mine, and the seas will run red with the blood of my enemies. <laughs> After a slight voodoo mishap... But Chuck, do you mind? I'd be in the middle of an unholy ceremony here. Unholy this? Unholy this? Yeah, I know, but he didn't give me much to work with. Hey! Ha! You can't defeat me that easily, sheep good. Wait, what's happening? Is that how the cutlass is supposed to work? I don't know, it's so bright. What the heck? Woof. We see LeChuck become a dashing human before an explosion sends Guybrush to Flotsam Island. 
As with most adventure games, the gameplay progresses solely through interacting with other characters and the environment. These interactions will give you clues for solving puzzles or artifacts that you can use later. Right off the bat, Guybrush must solve a three-piece puzzle in whatever order the player chooses. Start a bar fight, steal a ship, and find a hidden pirate treasure. If Guybrush can do all of these, he will be given the location of the voodoo lady. Welcome, Guybrush. The voodoo lady! When I met the voodoo lady, it was clear by her character design that she was an important character. And based on their interactions, I decided she must be a regular character in the franchise. Again, without any experience with the other Monkey Island games, I didn't know who or what was important, except by contextual design. For example, most of the characters you meet on Flotsam Island are not important characters. And like other characters in later chapters, they share three basic designs. Tall and skinny with a long face, mid-height and skinny with a round face, and short and fat with a wide face. If you meet a character like the voodoo lady who has her own character model, you realize that this person is important to the franchise or the story of this game. She sends us on a mission to find La Esponja Grande, the only cure for the pox. Later in the chapter, we meet a game-specific character in the Marquis de Singe. Ah, mon ami, that is a tale of triumph and tragedy. Many years ago, I was a young physician in the court of King Louis. Those were edited days, tending to the many ills of the aristocracy, navigating the scandalous palace intrigues. I was a rising star in the scientific firmament. And then? I mean, then? A conspiracy of jealous scientists accused me of performing inhumane cross-breeding experiments with the Queen's poodles! While he has his own character design, the dialogue makes it clear that he's a new invention. We discover that the winds pulling ships into Flotsam are the result of Desinge's experiments on local totems. After defeating De Singe and escaping the island on the screaming narwhal, we end the chapter with a sword to our throat and a female voice claiming she has been looking for us for a long time. Guybrush Threepwood, I've been waiting a long time for this. Now, wait a minute. I'm sure there's been some mistake. I don't even know you. Well, allow me to introduce myself. I am Morgan LaFlay, Mighty Pirate Hunter. Picking up immediately where the last episode ended, we find ourselves in a sword fight with Morgan LaFlay, famed pirate hunter. Morgan separates Guybrush from his corrupted hand before Guybrush forces her off his new ship. Unfortunately, the fight damages the screaming narwhal's mast. We travel to Spinner Cave for repairs and find Elaine negotiating between the king or queen of the Mer people and a pox riddled pirate. If we can find some golden idols, we will be given instructions for finding La Esponja Grande. The puzzles in this episode are slightly more challenging than the previous chapter, and they lead us to the human LeChuck, who is working with Elaine to make right all the wrongs he committed when he was evil. Use. Uh huh. Law thingy? Yes. Pearl. Ha ha! It fits perfectly! Yep, you now have yourself a fully functional murky. See? That wasn't too hard, was it? No, not at all. So now what? Ah, oh, brother. Guybrush refuses to trust him, but we must use this new ally to solve more puzzles. After solving the puzzles and finding the idols, the pox infested pirates begin a siege on the island. They wish to find La Esponja Grande and destroy it, as the pox has made them invincible. Tell me the ritual summoning words, or I'll plunge you into the icy blue! I will not let you summon the legendary sea creatures. You will not have a Esponja Grande. Fine. Let's see how long it takes you to drown with your head submerged in the sea. <laughs> I can breathe underwater 
one or two, you know. Don't tell me what I know, yo. Besides, then show me. I don't need to know stuff. I've got the box. Guybrush must strengthen his ship with a rubber tree and use the pirates' cannons against them. We end the chapter hot on the trail of La Esponja Grande, but we find Morgan stowed away on our ship and ready for a second match. Before the fight can begin, a giant manatee swallows our ship. Inside the belly of the beast, we meet Dekava, the voodoo lady's adventurer ex-boyfriend and his lazy crew. We must heal the manatee by gaining the crew's trust, and then we need Dekava's help retrieving the sponge. There it is, the legendary Esponja Grande. I've crossed seas, survived an island siege, thwarted countless enemies, said it will give or take, traveled the entrails of a manatee and courted marine life all for this one moment. Wow, it works! I feel better already! To take La Esponja Pequeño to a lane. We are healed by La Esponja Grande and ready to save the rest of the Jerkbait Islands. Unfortunately, once retrieving the sponge, we are attacked first by Dacava and his crew, and then by Morgan. While we're able to defeat Dacava, Morgan's attack ends the chapter with Guybrush's capture. Morgan returns us to the Marquis de Singe, but an angry mob captures us before he can enjoy his new prize. Guybrush has several charges against him, all carrying the penalty of death. Stan the Salesman, who was a key character in previous titles, represents the prosecution just as motivated to end Guybrush's life as the pox-infested residents of Flotsam Island. One charge at a time, Guybrush proves his innocence, but he has trouble proving that he has come to free everyone from the pox. Fortunately, Elaine shows up just in time. Unfortunately, the pox has infested Elaine and her pirate nature has taken all of her reason. LeChuck also arrives to point the blame for the spread of the pox on himself and the voodoo lady. Guybrush gets one last mission from the voodoo lady, tasked with feeding La Esponja Grande and growing its voodoo power. We cure the pox and eliminate the Marquis, but before we can celebrate, the human LeChuck murders us and reclaims his voodoo powers. Unlike the previous episodes, this one does not begin with exposition by the voodoo lady. Instead, we see her tarot cards and get sound clips from the previous episodes. In this, we see two things. First, the final episode recognizes how dark the last episode was in its ending. And second, the fate of the voodoo lady is unclear. But the game isn't over. Instead, we start the game in the spirit world, or as the game calls it, the crossroads. Oh, a new arrival! Hey! Sorry about that, but without the flash of enlightenment, old Caleb can't get a good exposure. Come, buy a souvenir picture! Uh, no thanks. I don't have any money. We learn that LeChuck had found a way to return to life, and now Guybrush must find the spell and the ingredients to get back to life. But things are not always as simple as they appear. Yes! That's it! Ah! 
Once Guybrush opens the portal to the world of the living, he opens a pathway for LeChuck to use La Esponja Grande to suck all the powers out of the spirit world. Fool Treepwood, what have you done? Ah! Talking crabs! Why did you open the crossroads? With the barriers shattered, the chuck is now beyond all control, plundering voodoo energy directly from the spirit realm. Guybrush gets another final quest from the voodoo lady despite her being in hiding. He must possess his corpse and put the sponge on a diet. Fortunately, my computer crashed before I could capture the footage of the ending, so I've decided that I'm not telling anyone the end. If you want to know how things end between Zombie Guybrush and Pirate God LeChuck, drop the 20 bucks to buy it for yourself. So in no particular order, here are my thoughts on Tales of Monkey Island. In future episodes, I will be discussing these ideas with others who play the game of the month. So make sure to join the Game Taffy Plays Facebook group for your chance to be a guest host on the podcast. I want to start with the humor. The franchise comes from the same crop as many other classic LucasArts franchises, including Maniac Mansion, Day of the Tentacle, and Grim Fandango. Comedy is in the game's blood, and there's an inherent risk to allowing another studio to take on the franchise. What if the game sucks? What if it doesn't live up to expectations? Fortunately, Telltale Games succeeded on all fronts. The only part of the experience that I did not enjoy was the references to the previous games in the first episode. After that, any legacy characters returning to the game were explained quickly enough to allow them to be a part of the story in their own way. Woe upon thee, foolish mortal! You have unleashed certain doom upon all your feeble, fleshy kind! For the wrath of Murray shall be... Very funny. Hi, Murray! For example, a franchise favorite character is the talking skull Murray. Whenever Guybrush finds a skull, he asks if it is Murray. And in the third episode, we find Murray locked in a treasure chest. Having no experience with the franchise, I was surprised at how quickly I fell in love with the character. In the fourth episode, we meet Stan. And even with no reference to who he was in the previous games, he is such a large character, you can't help but fall in love with him. But the game doesn't rely on nods to its previous incarnations. Throughout each episode, the game stands on its own writing and comedic timing to make the jokes punch. Even the puzzles rely on the player understanding the game's brand of humor. Speaking of the puzzles, the game has three types of puzzle. The two most common are single puzzles and multi-part puzzles. In the fourth episode, there is a five-part puzzle that must be solved in a specific order. And in the finale, another puzzle must be solved in a very specific order. But it's rare for you to see these types of puzzles. Usually, the game will start you off with a single puzzle to warm you up, then you'll get a three-part puzzle which you can solve in any order. This freedom allows you to work how you need. If you can't figure out how to find a pirate treasure or if you don't know how to steal a ship, work on the bar fight. In working on one puzzle, you may find a key or a clue for a different part of the puzzle. Rather than spending this whole show singing the game's praises, I do want to talk about the weakest elements, all found in its graphics. When playing on the PlayStation 3, I experienced a few uh, hiccups, and I mean that literally. Periodically, in the same spots consistently, the game would do a, sort of a double take? The only way to describe it is a hiccup. The other issue I had with the game was the reuse of character models with slight differences here and there. Huh? The name's Nippercat! Davy Nippercat! Reginald Van Winslow! Joaquin Jacinto de Mera Alfonso Teo! I mean, with so few characters in the game, I don't understand why extra time wasn't taken to make everyone look unique. <laughs> All of this is to say that Telltale Games' Tales of Monkey Island is, frankly, a benchmark in comedy gaming. 
even seven years after its release, the game still stands out as a wonderfully funny game. Too often, people try to compare video games to other art forms, particularly film. But that's as silly as comparing architecture to radio dramas. Video games are their own art form. And within this art, each one has a unique element to add to the field. Tales of Monkey Island takes a tested franchise and gives it new life. It points to the previous games in the franchise without leaning on its former glory. And most of all, it proves that video games have their own form of comedy. A comedy that forces players to get in on the joke. If you appreciate the art of video games and want to discuss it with others, please join the Game Taffy Plays Facebook group. There, you can share your insights, whether you're playing the game of the month or just want to share your thoughts about a game you love. And if you participate in the game of the month, you have a chance of becoming a guest host in the podcast. You can find me online as Ben the Wicked. If you enjoyed this look at Tales of Monkey Island, please like and share the video. And as everyone else requests, please subscribe. I try to upload a Let's Play video each day, and these podcasts will be available each month. And if you want to contribute to the channel with your ideas, leave a comment or send me a message. I'm listening. My name is Ben Davis. Thanks for joining me.